better than us. Have a great Sunday, everybody. Don't watch the Oscars. <laughs>We might lose a few uh, Republicans in the Senate. All you need is 51 to get it out of the Senate. So to pass the House uh, with a handful of uh, Republican votes, so to come to the Senate, it might get 51. It'll get vetoed by the President, and Republicans stand, will stand with the President to sustain his veto, and it will be deader than dead. So, so what do you want to say about this? I mean, here we have a situation where we continue to see break-ins yeah. at, the, at the border, right, at, right. At, the, at the ports as well. I mean, why would Republicans not be behind the president on this? Well, some people believe that the emergency declaration could lead to Democrats in the future doing the same thing on other issues. That's not my concern. My concern is a broken border. It is not a manufactured crisis. And what upsets me so much is that in 2013, almost all Democrats voted for $9 billion for border security, for barriers, as part of a $44 billion package. So to my Republican friends, it's clear to me they're not recognizing President Trump won. They're not having the same attitude about barriers under Trump as they did Obama. You're basically legitimizing, uh, marginalizing the Trump presidency by not by, by not standing by the president, because the Democrats are not playing fair with President Trump. He doesn't have any choice but to declare a national emergency, and he has all the legal authority needs to do it. And, and in terms of the money that he can gain from other agencies as a result of the right. national emergency, we're talking about, what, $3 billion, roughly, uh, from the money in the Treasury. I mean, tell us where this money comes from okay. and why you believe that these are monies that have been appropriated right. but not used and are available to the president in this regard. Well, he wants $5.7 billion. Now, what does that number represent? That number represents the top 10 priorities of the Department of Homeland Security as to where you actually need barriers. This is not President Trump sitting down and making stuff up. This is what the professionals tell us we need. These are the top 10 sites that we need a barrier to protect the border, and the total cost is 5.7. You take the 1.375 out of that, what what Congress gave him, and you go into the military construction uh, 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 a bill, you go into other pieces of legislation, you move money around, and you build out the wall, uh, the barrier. That's where he's going to get the money from, some from here, some from there. And the National Emergency Declaration has been used 50 times. Obama sent troops to the border. Bush 43 sent troops to the border. Trump is sending troops to the border. What's the difference between sending a soldier to the border to shore up the border than having a soldier build a barrier while they're there? Yeah. He has all the legal authority he needs, and I hope the Republicans will stand behind him. This is a defining issue in our party. Well, is this a defining issue also for 2020? I mean, is that what yes. this is all about, Senator 2020? Because we show the picture of the wall in Nancy Pelosi's state yeah 
virtually every Sunday, that wall that separates San Diego from Tijuana. Right. And we right. know that that wall works. But of course, when it comes from President Trump, Nancy Pelosi says it's immoral. So is this just about 2020, really, at the end of the day? This is about they hate Trump so much they will not give him a fraction of what we did for Obama and Bush. And to my Republican colleagues, we've sat down in good faith and tried to negotiate with Democrats and they basically stiffed the president and us. This is the only path left for the president. He made a promise to secure the border. It is not a manufactured crisis. It is a real serious national security problem. Stand behind the president as he goes through other accounts to get the money to build the barriers we need to be safe. This is about keeping your promises as President Trump. This is a great issue for 2020. It's a national security issue, but it's a political issue also. In the democratic world, there is no border crisis. It's all manufactured. In President Trump's world, in my world, there's a real problem at the border, and we're going to deal with it. That's a good debate to have. Let, let me move on to another border, and that is the border of Venezuela and, and, and Brazil. We've got news this right. morning on this. Of course, Maduro has been <laughs> defiant. He is blocking the aid that the allies have sent. Where is this going, and what's your reaction to now? We're talking about fatalities as a result of, of what has taken place yesterday with this unrest. The, Mad the Maduro regime will crumble over time. The international community, except for some outliers, are behind President Trump. This is his finest hour from my point of view. The speech he gave in Miami was his Reagan moment, where he talked about the benefits and the, the hope of freedom and democracy versus the scourge of socialism at home and abroad. This was his tear down this wall moment. So the people of Venezuela are going to keep coming and coming and coming. And the military is eventually going to realize that if they kill their own people, they're going to be war criminals in the eyes of the international community. And I'm trying to get Turkey and others to break away from Maduro and stand with Trump. So this regime will fall. And when it's all said and done, it will be President Trump who, who led us to this moment. This is a big deal in our backyard. It, it, it will fall, but right now, you know, he's digging in. He's mocking President Trump. He's mocking yeah. Guaido. He says uh, yesterday, I'm vowing to never surrender. Keep it up. He's going to fall because he doesn't have the trust of his people. Give me a scenario of where he turns Venezuela around. Show me how he can govern that country. He's a thug. He's a dictator. Bernie Sanders may not see that, but I see it. But most importantly, we finally got a president who stands up for our values in our backyard. And not only will Maduro fall, we're going to put pressure on Nicaragua and Cuba next. We're going to have in our backyard freedom and democracy, and we're going after socialist socialism on all fronts, including here at home. So I'll make a prediction on your show. It's not when Maduro, it's not if he falls, it's only when. It's just a matter of time. It's unsustainable. And to the people of Venezuela, the American people have your back. The Trump administration has your back. All right, we'll keep watching that. Let me move on to Syria. News on Friday night. You know, Senator, that the U.S. is now going to leave a total of 400 troops in Syria. Initially, right. when the news first broke that the president was pulling all 2,000 troops from Syria, you were not happy about it. You <laughs> right. discussed this with Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan when you were at the uh, when you were at the Munich uh, Security Summit. Yeah. Your reaction to now leaving 400 troops on the ground are they yeah. safe? Uh, yeah, they'll be safe, and the, mo the most important thing, they'll keep us safe. The reason we went into Syria is because Obama sat on the sidelines and watched Syria get dismantled by the Russians and the Iranians coming to Assad's aid. President Trump was dealt a bad hand in Syria, but he's played it very well. The caliphate has been destroyed. Well done, Mr. President. You promised to destroy the caliphate. We're down to a few blocks. These 200 troops in northeastern Syria will attract about a thousand NATO types. We'll have a stabilizing force. What have we accomplished? ISIS will never come back now. And what had been an 80 percent American presence, 20 percent European, is flipped to where the forces now will be 80 percent European, 20 percent American. 
Iran cannot come down and take over the oil with this stabilizing force, and Turkey and the Kurds will not go to war. This was one of the smartest decisions the president has made. We've interdicted the flow of arms from, from Tehran to Beirut. The Iranians were using a superhighway down south to get arms uh, to be used against Israel. Part of this force will stop that. This is a very smart adjustment. It will make sure ISIS doesn't come back. Turkey and the Kurds will not go to war. And Iran is the biggest loser of this. All right, so you do not believe then this will be pulling out to the extent that ISIS will be able to regroup and come back. You think the 400 troops on the ground will be enough to keep them at bay in terms of re regrouping? This is the Trump doctrine. 200 American forces will attract a thousand Europeans. Uh, it's I time see. for Europe to step up. Europe has hit harder from the caliphate than even the United States. Thousands died in Europe because of what happened in Iraq and Syria. So here's what Trump has said. I will stand with you. We'll provide air cover and we'll have a small force on the ground. But you got to do most of this stabilizing force and they will. I predict that 80 percent of this force in northeastern Syria will be Europeans, not Americans. And Trump has flipped it. It used to be 80 percent of us. Now it's going to be 80 percent Europeans, and that, that's the way it should be. And the force down south will prevent Iran from flowing weapons from Iran into Lebanon and Syria to hurt Israel. This was a really smart move. It changed the dynamic on the ground, and I want to applaud the president for making an adjustment that Obama would never make. All right, we want to move on to China because you've got U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer testifying this upcoming week at a House hearing talking about the China trade issues Look, we've talked about China aggressiveness on this program a lot in the year and in the last year and a half. It's not just trade and tariffs. It's espionage. It's military aggressions. Uh, it's f forced transfer of, of technology and IP theft. Right. This past week, I spoke with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and he characterized Chinese telecom company Huawei and his discussions in the last two weeks with uh, officials in Europe, in particular Poland. Listen to what he said. I've got to get your reaction to this, Senator. Watch. So we have spent time not just at this uh, ministerial in Warsaw last week where uh, we had some real successes, uh, but over the past months we've been out around the world uh, just making sure everybody had the same information, that, it, uh, that countries understand the risk of putting this Huawei technology into their uh, IT systems. Uh, we, we can't forget these, these systems were designed by, uh, with the express work alongside the Chinese PLA. Uh, they're military in China. Uh, they, uh, uh, they are creating a real risk for these countries and their systems, the security of their people. Europeans care deeply about their privacy. Uh, the risk to privacy from this technology is very, very real. And we're, we're out sharing this information, the knowledge that America has gained through its uh, vast network and uh, making sure countries understand the risk. That's important. We think they'll make good decisions when they understand that risk. It's not even just the risks for them. It's the risks for the world. I mean, if you are in high level talks about national security with Poland, with the five eyes, I mean, your Americans information is out you there, bet. too, because China has tapped into their network. There's, there's a second piece that we've shared with them as well which is if a country adopts this and puts it in some of their critical information systems, we won't be able to share information with them. We won't be able to work alongside them. In some cases, there's risk. We won't even be able to co-locate American resources, an American embassy or an American military outpost. Uh, there's real risk, and we want to make sure they know not only the risk to their own people, um, but their risk of being able to work alongside the United States and keeping the world safe. Senator, what's your reaction? That was a major headline to me. Yeah. Are we going to... Too not share information if they've got Huawei Telecom? Well, my initial reaction is thank God that Mike Pompeo is the Secretary of State because he speaks a language even I can understand. Uh, yes, if you're a European uh, country thinking about going on the 5G uh, Chinese network, what Mike Pompeo is saying to you is that we believe this is a spying platform that will not be able to share information with you that we would have otherwise because you'll be giving it to China and the technology you're buying for China will basically crowd you out of the American market. Uh, the Trump administration has told the world if you do business with Iran, you're not going to do business with the United States. This is a dictator dictatorial regime and we're trying to crush it. I think what Mike is saying pretty clearly, if you pick Chinese technology 
uh, like the 5G systems they're trying to sell, you'll wind up losing access to American information and systems make a wise decision. Wow, that is a big statement there. Senator, I've got to get your, your take on how China fits into the North Korea summit next week. Let's take a short break. We want to look sure. ahead to the North Korea uh, Kim Jong-un summit with President Trump, as well as what you're planning at the Senate Judiciary Committee ahead of that Mueller report. A lot more with Senator Lindsey Graham when we come right back. Stay with us. Media. Welcome back. I'm back with Senator Lindsey Graham looking ahead to the uh, meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un in Vietnam this upcoming week. Senator, what can we expect from your standpoint? What would be a victory here? Because I know that maybe uh, North Korea has been quieter, no missile launches. Right. But the idea that there has <clears throat> been denuclearization, I mean, that just hasn't happened. So what should we expect in terms of a victory? A roadmap to get to denuclearization, a roadmap to change the North Korean economy, to make it more prosperous, and to give the assurances to Chairman Kim he needs to give up his nukes. How does this end? A peace treaty between the United States, China, South Korea, North Korea. They give up their nukes. We help them develop their economy, and uh, all, all ends well. The goal is to get a roadmap. Uh, to accomplish those tasks. Senator, there is word this morning that, you know, he could back off from an earlier demand that North Korea fully denuclearize and, right. and you know, uh, and, and that's before the U.S. makes any concessions. So is that the kind of negotiation that you're expecting? Let's give Trump the latitude he needs to get the result we all want. Number one, how well did other people do before Trump? He was handed a very bad hand on North Korea. Obama let the whole world just run wild. And when Trump came in, they were developing missiles and testing bombs. All that has stopped. We have a goal now. Give up your nukes. We'll provide you the security you need and help you become more prosperous. So what I hope will happen is that out of this negotiation, we'll have a roadmap and sort of a timetable that will get us there. And if Trump wants to adjust what he said before, to take some of the pressure off now, to get them to move at a faster pace. I'm all with him. The key to this is China. We should be looking at a new deal with China, not just on trade, but how they help us with North Korea. I want a better relationship with China. It's not too much to ask them to stop cheating us out of market share. And one of the things China could do to help us is get North Korea to give up their nukes. So uh, the more China can do, the quicker this will get done. So that would be something you'd like to see in a China deal, some commitment that they would be yeah. helpful there. Because on the IP theft and the, and the forced transfer of technology, can you really change a culture, Senator? I mean, I just I, I feel yeah, like China believes that they were number one. They were this dominant force thousands of years ago, and they want their rightful place again and perhaps right. don't care how they get there, whether it's stealing other people's ideas or not. Right. Well, their economy has had about a 30-something percent hit because Trump has stood up to them. That's true. They sell us, they sell us a lot more <clears throat> than we buy from them. Uh, we want a better balance of trade, but what we want to do is stop business practices that cheat us out of market share. We've got an agreement on currency manipulation. That's the one of the ways they cheat us out of market share. Intellectual property theft, changing the rules. If you go to China, you've got to hire a Chinese business partner who will steal you blind. What we want is China to play by the WTO, WTO rules as a developed nation. That's not too much to ask. And it's not too much to ask China to help us with a neighbor called North Korea that's creating uh, un instability throughout the world. So Trump is putting pressure yeah. on China, unlike any president in my lifetime. We want a deal, but it's got to be a good deal on all fronts. Wow, these are high stakes uh, for sure. Senator, stay with us. Fox News is learning that the Mueller report won't be released to the Justice Department this week amid growing speculation that the Rust uh, Russia investigation is wrapping up. We right. want to know what you're going to do with your subpoena power at the Judiciary Committee. We'll be right back with that with Senator Lindsey Graham slash ed and get started for just five dollars while supplies last
Welcome back now to the timing of the Robert Mueller report. Fox News is learning it will not be released to the Justice Department this upcoming week while the president is overseas, despite reports that the Russian investigation is all but done. Back with me this morning is Senator Lindsey Graham. He's a Republican from South Carolina and the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He also serves on the Senate Appropriations, Foreign Relations and Budget Committees. And Senator, I want to turn to your oversight uh, plans uh, in, in terms of this uh, DOJ FBI story. Uh, the right. Mueller report, what are you expecting there first? Well, under the regulation, the uh, attorney general has to report to me and the ranking member, Diane Feinstein, a summary of what was found. Uh, who, who is going to be, be pursued criminally, if anybody at all, kind of a summary. He doesn't have to give us the entire report. But my belief is that Collusion really is conspiracy, and nobody has been charged with a crime of conspiracy. Everybody who has been charged has been processed crimes or financial crimes. So my belief is that there is no collusion between the Trump campaign uh, and the Russians. And if they had been, somebody would have been charged by now with a conspiracy. But we'll know in a couple of weeks. Well, doesn't somebody have to come out and say that then? I mean, uh, honestly, Senator, it's been two years. And Mueller this collusion will. idea is in the zeitgeist out there. You've got right. Adam Schiff continuing this narrative that he has more than circumstantial evidence uh, <laughs> that there was collusion and he's got nothing to show for it. And nobody puts him on the spot about it. Can you just keep hearing this stuff float around or is somebody actually going to come out in authority and say there was no collusion? Well, I think Mueller is going to be the person most people listen to, not Adam Schiff. Uh, the Mueller report will be out soon. If there is no evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian intelligence community, uh, then that should be the end of all this. I've seen no evidence of collusion. And if the Democrats keep pushing this, it's going to blow up in their face uh, in 2020. Mueller will let us know in a couple of weeks, but what I'm going to do is look at the Department of Justice and the FBI and look at the other side of the story. How was a counterintelligence investigation opened up against the Trump campaign? How did they get a warrant against an American citizen on four separate occasions based on a document paid for by the Democratic Party that was a bunch of garbage? We're going to find out about that, too. Well, that's exactly right. And, and we're going to talk with Trey Gowdy coming up. And one thing that he made a point of telling me uh, going into this interview was that there were actually three investigations happening, which is what we heard from Andrew McCabe, who's on this book tour, even though he has been uh, criminally uh, referred for criminal charges there. What are you expecting from Bill Barr? He's on the job now two weeks. Uh, no doubt he's probably already sat with Robert Mueller, right? Right. Well, I'm, I expect him to clean up the place. Number one, going forward, what are the rules to open up a counterintelligence investigation on a presidential campaign? I believe foreign governments were trying to uh, get inside the Clinton campaign. They're going to be doing this in the future. They're always going to be coming after us. Uh, remember when Dianne Feinstein had a staff member that was working for the Chinese intelligence community? The FBI went to her, told her about it, and she fired them. Why did they not do the same for Trump. The counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign, I think, was a backdoor attempt to infiltrate the campaign. They used a confidential informant. Well, what did the confidential informant find about the Trump campaign in Russia? Apparently nothing, because there was no mention of a confidential informant in obtaining a warrant against Carter Page. So this is a real mess. Did they really sit down and try to overthrow the president by invoking the 25th Amendment? I'm going to get to the bottom of that. I'm going to have McCabe come in, Rosenstein come in, anybody and everybody around that conversation. And we're going to find out who's lying. Every American should be worried about what happened in 2016. Was this an effort by the, uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI senior officials to fix an election, to undercut a president who was legitimately elected? If the shoe were on the other foot, we'd be having a lot more attention to this if it had been about a Democratic president instead of Trump. So you're, you're committing to, to getting to the bottom of it through your subpoena power. You're going to get these guys here yes. to testify. And you said the last time I was with you that you're going to get all the people who signed on to that FISA warrant. Uh, that would include Rod Rosenstein, Sally Yates, uh, who else? Uh, Peter Strzok. Uh, Comey. How, how could the Department of Justice tell the FISA court 
that the dossier prepared by Christopher Steele was reliable when they told the president after he got elected, here's the dossier, we can't prove any of it, we just want you to know about it. How could they cer certify that same document was reliable enough to get a warrant? To this day, it's not verified. It was a product produced by a foreign agent, paid for by the Democratic Party. Can you imagine if the Republicans had hired somebody to go to Russia uh, to spy on Clinton and they produced a document that was a bunch of garbage? They'd be destroying us as a party. So yeah, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Did they try to invoke the 25th Amendment? Did they lie to the FISA court? Did they open up a counterintelligence investigation yeah. against Trump in a sham way? We're going to find out about all this. Well, you know what keeps getting me is every time you hear Andrew McCabe talk about this investigation that he launched, that he <laughs> wanted to make sure was staying in place, you never hear why. And then the 25th Amendment conversation, well, why? What was the predicate? Don't you need a predicate to launch a major investigation into a sitting president? A criminal investigation requires probable cause of a crime. A counterintelligence investigation is designed to protect American interests against foreign influence. They told Dianne Feinstein, oh, by the way, there may be a Chinese spy on your staff. The counterintelligence investigation against Trump should have been to protect the Trump campaign. Right. Did they ever go to President Trump and tell him about this? No. This is just two different all, rules. It's all extraordinary, and it is good to see you this morning, Senator. Thanks so much. Thank you. Lindsey Graham, right after this quick break, Congressman Trey Gowdy joins the conversation. We're looking ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. We'll be right back. Deuce urges to urinate so you can enjoy more of life's best moments. Welcome back. The Robert Mueller probe, the Russia probe, is showing signs of winding down. But critics are accusing House Intel Committee Chairman Adam Schiff of unleashing a conspiracy theory with his recent claim after Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Richard Burr said his panel found no evidence of collusion. So now we've heard from the Senate, the House, the DOJ, and now the FBI. And look at these headlines. The Wall Street Journal publishing this op-ed. Shifting to phase two of collusion. Conspiracy theorists looking for something new, anticipating a Mueller letdown. Another piece published by the Washington Examiner this weekend. Adam Schiff has conclusion pro uh, collusion problems rather of his own. That after he met with Glenn Simpson in Aspen uh, a couple of months ago. Our next guest disagrees with Schiff's recent statement that evidence of collusion is in, quote, plain sight. And joining me right now is former South Carolina congressman, former chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Trey Gowdy is with me right now. He's also a Fox News contributor and a former federal prosecutor. Congressman, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes, ma'am. Thank well, you. Well, what was it a year and a half ago when Adam Schiff came out and went on the Sunday morning programs and said, I have more than circumstantial evidence that there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians. How is it possible that he has not corrected himself at this point since we've heard from the Senate, the House, the DOJ, and now through Andrew McCabe's own words, the FBI, that we have yet to see any collusion? Well, he never goes on shows where he's actually going to be pressed on it. I mean, what a, what a brilliant strategy Adam has. I'm going to make this bombastic statement completely unsupported by the facts, but I'm never going to go on any show where I'm asked about it. Maria, the House Intelligence Committee, no evidence of conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia. The Senate Intelligence Committee, and remember, the media love the Senate investigation. They didn't care too much about Devin Nunes in the House, but they love Richard Burr in the Senate investigation. No evidence of conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia. Mueller's indictments, no indictments showing conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia. There's never been a witness who's alleged conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia. And yet Adam Schiff, that, that, that three-eyed raven, Adam Schiff, who can see things nobody else can see, says he has evidence more than circumstantial, not quite direct. By the way, for those who didn't go to law school, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as evidence that is not circumstantial or direct. But Adam has seen it and he's never pressed on it. Yeah, it's pretty incredible, actually, because, you know, this this issue is still out there. We're waiting for Robert Mueller to wrap up his report with some conclusions here. But at this point, we are hearing from people like Andrew McCabe, who is now on a book tour, as you know, uh, talking about things like 25th Amendment, how this effort was underway to remove the president and how he was 
so sure that he needed that uh, investigation in place uh, to make sure to find the collusion. What do you make of, of Andrew McCabe out the way he is talking about what he's been talking about, even though he's been referred for criminal charges by the inspector general? Well, let's go back to May the 9th, I believe it was, Comey is fired, and Andy McCabe wants you to believe that the Department of Justice and the FBI were just in utter chaos, and they thought the President of the United States might be an agent of Russia, and they thought the President of the United States may be guilty of criminal obstruction of justice. This is May the 9th of 2017. Two days later, Andy McCabe is before the Senate Intelligence Committee with the entire world watching. It's on worldwide television. And he's got the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he doesn't say one single solitary word about Donald Trump being an agent of Russia or uh, criminally obstructing justice. And if that's not good enough, if two days wasn't enough time for Andy to process that, in June of 2017, he's right back before the Senate Intelligence Committee. If you really believed, Andy, that Donald Trump was an agent of Russia, why did you tell CBS and not Congress? If you really, Andy, believed that Donald Trump criminally obstructed justice, why did you tell CBS, but you didn't tell the United States Congress a month after you discovered it. Yeah, I mean, this is really stunning because he was in Washington testifying back to back days and he didn't say anything about that. Then he also didn't discuss what we learned in the CBS interview that there were actually three investigations into Donald Trump or his campaign or his presidency. Isn't that right? Yeah, there were four opportunities that Andy McCabe had to tell either the House or the Senate what he told CBS. Four separate independent opportunities to do so. And, and the reason I say three investigations, you had the July 2016 investigation that was initiated and signed off on by Peter Strzok. That was into the Trump campaign. And then when Comey is fired, Andy McCabe proudly told CBS that he launched his own counterintelligence investigation into whether or not Donald Trump was a was an agent of Russia. And then for good measure, he launched a criminal investigation into obstruction of justice. So I'm not great with math, but that's three separate investigations into a duly elected president, near as I can tell, simply because he fired Jim Comey. Right. Or he, they didn't like him. I mean, you know, obviously we, we know they didn't like him based on all those biased texts between Peter Strzok and, and Lisa Page. But, I mean, you're a federal, former federal <laughs> prosecutor. Don't you need a predicate, a real evidence-based reason to launch a criminal investigation into a duly elected sitting president? Uh, you need an evidentiary basis to launch an investigation into anyone, anyone whether right? it's the president of the United States or not. Uh, and that's also true with counterintelligence investigations. I mean, look, the American people give these awesome powers to our law enforcement agencies. And, and, and those powers are to keep us safe from foreign adversaries and domestic adversaries. We give them awesome powers. Yeah. And what they do not expect is for Andy McCabe or Peter Strzok or Lisa Page to have these historic levels of bias and launch counterintelligence and criminal investigations simply because you wish someone had not been elected president. Right. Exactly. All right. For, uh, Congressman, stay with us. I want to talk about accountability with you. I want to get your take on what we might learn from Robert Mueller and also have you react to something one of your former colleagues said on this program last week, and that was John Ratcliffe, who joined us. Stay with us. More with Trey Gowdy when we come right back. How sexy are these elbows? Get clear skin that can last. Ask your dermatologist about Cosentix. As a conspiracy starts to unravel, sometimes the co-conspirators turn on one another and you get inconsistent testimony. Uh, Bruce Orr's testimony is inconsistent with his boss, Sally Yates. Uh, Annie McCabe's testimony is inconsistent with his boss, Jim Comey. Jim Comey's testimony is inconsistent with his lawyer, Jim Baker. McCabe's testimony is also inconsistent with Rod Rosenstein. So you have all of these things that were taking place, and again, it underscores the point that there were uh, senior officials at the Department of Justice that were uh, the same officials that had undermined uh, and prejudged uh, Hillary Clinton 
uh, as innocent prejudge Donald Trump as guilty, uh, and they were the ones making the decisions in these investigations. And that was uh, that was Congressman uh, John Ratcliffe with me here last week. Uh, he, of course, a member of the Intel as well as Judiciary Committees. I am back with former South Carolina Congressman and former Chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Trey Gowdy. He's also a Fox News contributor and a former federal prosecutor. And, and Congressman, your thoughts on what you just heard from your former colleague, John Ratcliffe. Are we going to see any accountability here? You've got Bill Barr. Is he going to be seeking the truth on this? Bo Robert Mueller about to come up with his report. What's your reaction to actually seeing accountability on all of this? Well, Maria, let me say this. One of the great privileges of my eight years in Congress was working alongside John Ratcliffe, who's a brilliant lawyer and an even better person. And what you just heard from Johnny is evidence of a serious investigation, not these five minute congressional, but every one of the people that Johnny just referenced was deposed by a committee of Congress with no time limits on the ability to ask questions. So is there going to be accountability? It depends upon whether tribunals are willing to do what Johnny just did, which is spent hours interviewing the Jim mm. Bakers and the Jim Comeys. Remember, we had Comey for two whole days. I just listened to Lindsey Graham. He sounds really, really serious about providing oversight. Bill Barr, when he was being confirmed, said he was serious about it. Michael Horowitz, the inspector general, is a serious man and a straight arrow. Yeah. This is not a Republican or Democrat issue, Maria. Everyone should have a Department of, of Justice if they have confidence. And in fact, we won't make it as a republic if you don't have confidence. So fair oversight, no artificial time limits, and do it with, with serious people like John Rackley. We'll see about that. Trey Gowdy, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And we will see you soon. Trey Gowdy there. General Jack Keane is up next on the upcoming Trump-Kim summit in Vietnam. Back in a moment. Welcome back. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un traveling to Vietnam as we speak ahead of his second summit with President Trump. The president is hoping to make progress in the denuclearization negotiations concessions. General Jack Keane is a retired four-star general. He is chairman at the Institute for the Study of War. He is also a Fox News senior strategic analyst. And General, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. What can we expect from this upcoming summit? Well, let me first say, I think a couple of things are coloring this summit, and uh, I want our viewers to understand that. One, one is, is that there's been some significant communication between Kim Jong-un and the president. And I think the nature of those letters and the number of them have surprised the administration. The letters are personal. And as a result of that, there really is a relationship that has come together, not just because of the Singapore meeting, but even more so because of this communication. The second thing is, is that the Trump administration has come to the realization that for a country that spent 15 years acquiring nuclear weapons and now is a bona fide nuclear power with ballistic missiles is not going to denuclearize them, disarm all of them in two years. They realize that that is unrealistic objective. And in the Asian culture, something I'm familiar with, trust is a very important denominator and it takes a lot of time to build that trust. And that is part of what is at play here. So I think, to answer your question, I don't believe we're going to get what we've wanted from the first summit on, which is a inventory of their weapons, a timetable to support denuclearization, and a commitment for independent observers. I believe the administration has pulled back from that. I suspect what we may get is a commitment to end the, end the war, the armistice, etc. All the countries become signatories to that. And that would be progress going forward. I mean, if eventually the next step would be, not immediately, to pull forces away from the DMZ. Mm. If North Korea would pull their army, which is their, almost their entire army is there, and, and South Korea would pull their forces away, as a result of that peace treaty, that would be consequential. It's not denuclearization, but it certainly does add a dimension to the trust factor. What, what Kim Jong-un is seeking, two things, mm. economic prosperity and security. And what we're seeking, one thing, 
disarm nuclear weapons, disarm ballistic missiles. Well, North Korea wants sanctions relief, right? I mean, is that one of the things, the fact that they want relief from the sanctions that are in place? And would they go as far as giving us the inventory, telling us exactly what missiles they've got? Where is the, the, the full accounting of the nuclear weapons and the ballistic missiles? They definitely want sanction relief, and this is the card that they have played with previous presidents. And with previous presidents, they always got some sanction relief, and then they never fulfilled the promise. I don't believe the Trump administration is going to go down that road, because they know full well what has happened in the past. And secondly, the only reason why the summit is actually taking place is because we've got those, slap, those sanctions slapped on North Korea. And exactly. that, is our, that is our leverage, Maria. Yeah. Now, what we could do, we can open up a liaison office in North Korea and we could provide some humanitarian aid not economic relief but humanitarian aid to assist some of the people in North Korea that are, are have malnutrition and are starving yeah. and also have medical issues general real quick I want to switch gears because I want to make sure to get this in before we go and that is the troop level in Syria the president saying now he's going to leave 400 there we need allies to do the same I guess work with us is that enough what's your reaction to this change now well let's set the table here for a second first of all the Syrian democratic forces that Syrian Kurds and Syrian Arabs have been fighting for four years yeah and we have been assisting them their number is 60,000 strong so they are the main fighting force I say secondly yes 400 it's a low number but what do we need our forces to do we need our forces to coordinate artillery support and air power east of the Euphrates River Valley I'll leave it to the military folks to determine if that's enough to do that. Now, the, the State Department is doing a very smart thing. Not only are they asking the British and the French to stay, because they're already there on the ground with their special forces, they're going to the countries in Europe that ISIS has attacked. Mm. What am I talking about? Norway, Belgium, Germany. Get them to ante up to protect their people in the future because they already have a stake in the game. ISIS has killed their citizens wow. and let's let's get them to put in play here. So many important points that you make, General. Thank you so much for being here this morning. So your Sunday. Smart news. I was only